Shall we get yeah. going, yeah. gentlemen? Yes. Again, I will ask you, uh, we did this again, we did this yesterday, so this is kind of round two, though we have almost all new questions, perhaps other than uh, one repeat question, but I'm going to ask that we answer succinctly and briefly, but to the point, so just so we can cover as much as possible in some limited time. And it's been a long day, everyone's tired, we get that, so even attention spans get a little bit uh, shaky, but we'll do our best here. And um, I'd like to start this out with something that's not on our notes, gentlemen, it's not in the questions at all. But we've just heard today, we've heard, uh, we've heard Michelle talk about these are days of delusion. She actually had a presentation in Minneapolis that was called the very same thing, the days of delusion. We actually have days of complete incompetence, at least in, in Washington, let's be honest, these are days of incompetence in Washington. These are days of, quite frankly, I'll be blunt, since we're all probably gonna be hunted down after tonight anyway. <laughs> Um, <laughs> these are days of treason. These are days of treason. Treason. How must the church be behaving today? How can the church counter delusion, deception, treason, incompetence? How can the pulpits come against this? Jack, Amir, Barry, let's start with Jack. Psalm 107, verse 20 says, I've, I've sent you my word to heal you from all of your destructions. The Bible tells us, Paul wrote to Timothy, that the church of the living God is the ground and the pillar of all truth. And so today, the answer is, uh, pastors need to either be in the word of God more or get out. Mm -hmm. They need to step up or step out. This is not a time, this is not a time for spiritual weakness. We are warring against mm -hmm. invisible forces. Yes. It is overwhelmingly obvious, and uh, it's, it's no longer vogue, cool, or hip to be a Christian. It is warfare, and it's very clear. It's very, very clear. Mm -hmm. Yes. I believe that <clears throat> we should not make sounds of surprise. All of us, we've been studying the scriptures and we know that that's exactly what the end is going to look like. These, these are the last days, obviously. And when the Bible says the last days, people will have those delusions. That uh, we, we, we know that everything that is happening now, and I, even, even the fact that for Israel to stand alone, America cannot, cannot be as strong as it used to be. So all of these things are not a surprise to any of us. These things must happen, the Bible say. And uh, for all I know, God is above time. God saw these things happening already when he sent us a beautiful email with an attachment to the book of Revelation. And he says, look, these are the things that are going to happen. Trust me, I've seen it, I know, it's going to happen. So when they happen, we must Tell people these are the things that had to happen. And also, but the book of Revelation is, is the beautiful love letter of Jesus to the church on the, in the very beginning, at the very end, and in between the consequences of the, of the sinful nature of man. And they can either be not condemned, as in John 3 it says, or they are condemned already. And to be not condemned is to believe in Jesus as the only way, only truth, and only life, and that no one comes to the Father but through him. And to preach Jesus, not to preach any other thing, and to preach salvation, and to preach what it means to be a sinner, what the wages of sin are, and what is the free gift of salvation is, and how to live. And we, we have to make the name of Jesus known from pulpits more than any other name. Amen. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Mm -hmm. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. And the word reproach means to insult or to injure. And I think we as a church need to 
change our thinking and recognize this is an opportunity to glorify God. Remember, Peter is the one who, when the apostles were beaten for Christ's name's sake, they rejoiced that they suffered in the same manner of Jesus. So this is an opportunity, and I think we have to remember, uh, especially today, you know, I hear people say things like, you know, the church shouldn't meet for the sake of everyone's health. Well, since when has the church only met when it's safe? It wasn't safe in the first century. You know, we've all seen the fish on the back of a car or on a t-shirt, the ichthus symbol. Do you know what that was all about? The Greek, Greek symbols mean Jesus Christ, God's son, savior. And it was drawn in the sand as a secret symbol between church members. Why? Because they were risking their lives to be Christians. That's where the church started. So why in the world would we ever think that we're going to be exempt from that kind of persecution? This is nothing more than a season and opportunity to bring glory to God by being faithful to him in all that we say and do. Okay, uh, question number eight here. <clears throat> and some good questions and we'll hit as many as we can. Uh, some quick bullet points on how to spot pastors who are starting uh, to go woke, the progressive Christian theology. How do we spot, what are the buzzwords for progressive Christian theology? And I, I talked about a couple of them. Social justice is gonna be huge. Social justice and critical race theory are a couple of things you wanna listen for. Mm -hmm. I think they're maybe the two biggest, but there's many others, pastors. I actually don't know how to answer that because yeah. I haven't, I, I haven't listened to one woke pastor. I'm not, no, no, I'm, I'm not kidding. I don't know what the tipping, the, the, the words are. I, I have not listened to one. I refuse. I'm very careful about what goes into my ears, and I've never heard one. I feel bad for Jan, because she, thank God, she's the, she's the watchman on the wall. She, she, listens to all this junk that's out there and I and to to for her radio by the way if you don't listen to her radio program you better start huh? and listen because she talks about these people so I don't have to okay I'm gonna I'm gonna guess I don't think it's a stretch they probably don't talk about sin they yeah. probably don't talk about repentance they're not going to mention the cross they're not going to mention sacrifice, I'm guessing. Uh, they're not going to go through the Bible uh, expositionally. They'll avoid that. If, if, if they stop skipping uh, chapters of the Bible, man, I tell you what, I'd, get, I'd literally get out. If I started skipping yeah. verses and chapters in the, in the Bible, this church would get up and leave, and so well, they, they should. They generally disdain eschatology, Bible prophecy, yes. and they'll never, ever be a real friend exactly. To Israel, but but Amir, mm. you travel in the church more than anybody here, um, so give us your perspective. Well, that's exactly it. Uh, before I started traveling around the world, the Lord really spoke to me, and He said, "Everywhere you go, and they teach wrong about Israel, you know that they teach wrong the rest of the Bible." <laughs> Israel is like the litmus test for for this whole thing, and I want you to know that um, even more so they will refrain from touching prophecy. Look, the two disciples mm -hmm. that were on their way to Emmaus, if you remember that, they were disciples. They were not the, 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 the Pharisees or Sadducees or they were not the Romans. It was the disciples that were with Jesus for three years almost every day. And they were walking all the way from Jerusalem to Emmaus and they were sad. And that was Sunday morning, and that was after the angel already told the woman that Jesus is already risen, and Mary saw him alive. All of that to say, and what is it that Jesus said as he was walking with them? He said, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that which the prophets mm -hmm. have said. He, he, he basically rebuked his own disciples that when they don't believe the prophets, prophecy. They miss out the whole point 
of, of the plan of God of salvation, of who the Messiah is and what Messiah is, ought, is all about. So as far as I'm concerned, when they leave prophecy out and when they are no longer uh, standing for Israel, it is the number one uh, uh, a sign that they go woke and progressive. And look, that's the progression of the world. Mm. The progression of the believer is when they realize that Jesus, it was Jesus. What did they do? <laughs> they turn around and walk back to Jerusalem that same night. That's the progression of the believer, back to Jerusalem. The progression of the church that is not into Jesus is to Emmaus. There is down the road to Emmaus, the road of shame, the road of, 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 of um, embarrassment and, and sadness, and there's a road of victory, and there is a road of, uh, a road of we now understand, and now we can preach the gospel. He is alive, and to add more, he is coming back very soon. Amen. Gary? Yeah, I was uh, thinking as Jack was talking about, you know, I don't listen to this nonsense either. It, it takes me too quickly to the phrase, shut up. So, and I don't want to go there. But, you know, I, I think the, the reality is, if we want to just throw a simple litmus test, if you're hearing more about improving your this life situation and solving society's woes than you are about being equipped to get people into the kingdom of God, leave. Okay. I, I, I want part, the, I'm going to raise part B of this question, and it's not on our list, gentlemen, but this is part B of, this, of the question. So then if, it, it, let's just say this is, it's a very sound pulpit. Let's say they are preaching salvation, um, but they would never touch the issue of the king is coming back, or they would never preach a message or even give a statement from the pulpit that we must stand with Israel are these deal breakers. Again, let's say it's a sound pulpit, but they will not touch some important issues that we consider vitally important. Is that a deal breaker? Do we then go to the church down the street or across town? Or do we stay with a church that's a sound pulpit? Jack. Uh, let me be very clear before I give you my answer. Number one, you can differ on the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib because of how you were brought up. Now, I don't mean to say this to hurt anybody, but if you are a mid-trib rapture individual or post-tribulationist, you are a product of a denominational view. You did not come to those conclusions on your own. Okay? Why do you say that? Now I answer the question about a deal-breaker is I don't hold the view that if you are a mid or post tribber you're going to hell. No, that's ridiculous. And by the way, this church tomorrow, there'll be mid and post tribbers here getting healed. <laughs> uh, from, but but here's, here's the thing. I do not believe that you can be a New Testament church in the true definition of a New Testament church. Because to, to avoid... Bible prophecy is to excise out of your scripture 27 to 30 percent of your Bible. The Holy Spirit would never do that. The book, the book of Revelation, chapter 19, tells us that Jesus himself is the spirit of prophecy. It's the defining point by how you know. Jesus said, I've told you these things in advance, that when they happen, you will know that ego e me, that I am. That is the self-contained, self-existing, eternal God. If you leave Bible prophecy out, I don't think you can be a New Testament church. Amir, is it a deal breaker? I'm not a businessman, and I'm not sure about deals, I, but it, let's put it this way. <laughs> He's Jewish. <laughs> you hear so many people that are telling but I am not a businessman, you know that. This is true. You know that. You, you, you rebuked me so many times. For you're a Jew, how can you not know that? Now watch this. Many times people write you 
yes. Look, we are Jews. We cannot talk without our hands. I'm Portuguese. I can do the same thing yeah. you can do. Listen, how many times did you uh, encounter people that say we don't have any church around oh, in you oh. know 10, 20, 30? 10, 20, so I'm 30, saying 40 this. Months. So yes. I'm saying this. If that's the only church around, go there and take food supplement. Okay. He said, go there and take food supplements. No, good, good point. Good and point. the supplement are watching others online that whatever. are teaching Bible prophecy teaching. because you don't get that in your church. All right, good. Good so point. that's, you see, I... Were you, were you, were well, that's what you, I meant. Did you mean to say, behold Israel dot No, I did not. <laughs> no, I meant uh, that you can definitely watch any one of... See. That was a clue. Uh, here. And no, I, really. I was, see, he's not a businessman because I was trying to put, promote him and help. I know, I'm not a businessman. But business he didn't man. get it. I'm not. But okay. I can tell you that... If that's the only church around, you do not want to say, okay, they don't teach Bible prophecy, I'm not going to church at all. Okay? You need that fellowship, trust me. But then that's why you have food supplements. Yeah, Take well, some BI vitamin. <laughs> and <laughs> Hello? RL. There you go. Uh, RL vitamin. <laughs> okay. We I'm should probably end you. this now. <laughs> Well, let's let Barry Wagan go ahead, Barry. I think it's kind of neat to think that post-tribbers and mid-tribbers are going to come uh, become pre-tribbers in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. So <laughs> that is true. They're in for a very pleasant surprise. There's no question about that. But I, I agree. You know, everybody. I a uh, long time ago when I was first getting into teaching, I heard a pastor say, "Stay in your own lane. If you're not funny by nature, don't try and be funny." If you're more cranial, stay in that lane. Teach through the means and manner that God has gifted you in. And, you know, a lot of guys are intimidated by Bible prophecy and these other things, but it's part of the book. It needs to be taught as you come upon it in Scripture. You can't just skip over those things because they're hard. I mean, if we skipped over everything that wasn't uh, or that was hard or difficult, we'd be teaching John 3.16 every week because everybody knows that. But there are things in Scripture that are hard to deal with. And you come into the uh, Daniel 7 and 8 and some of these things that require a lot of study and a lot of homework uh, to understand them fully and completely, especially in light of the times that we live in today. And it takes that effort uh, to get in there and mine those things out. And um, not everybody's willing to do that, uh, but they should be. But, you know, again, I think the supplemental thing is important. And that's the thing we've heard more than anything else when we've been out all over the world, quite literally. We hear it constantly. Nobody's teaching Bible prophecy. Right, right. We can't find a Bible teaching church. Mm -hmm. So, sadly, I think a lot of people are forced into the situation where if they're going to get fed the things they ought to be fed, they have to go online. Yeah. But that does not substitute for being in fellowship. I feel led, I feel led to interrupt him on this. Um, I, it's so important that that 27 plus percent of the Bible be yeah. taught. The reason why you get all these calls and emails and when why we're talking about this right now is because I'm trying to, I, I think maybe Dallas Theological Seminary might be left in this. Seminaries are cranking out yes. ministers who will become pastors yes. who've had no right. eschatology courses. That is exactly right. And that's, listen, it's impossible to, to, to dodge that. So people are going to go pay $100,000 to get their doctorate in theology and come out expecting to be a pastor of a church and the world around them is being prophetic, if they like it or not, is happening. Yes. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say, so they avoid it because they've never been taught in the seminaries. Okay? So that's not a good start. But the very first, track me now on this, the very first Bible prophecy in the Bible. So the first eschatological teaching in the Bible was a soterological passage. Meaning this, the first prophetic word given by God regarding your salvation 
was a word that Messiah, salvation, would come in the future. It's Genesis 3.15. It's the first prophecy in the Bible is about salvation. You miss that, you miss both. You can't miss it. And so watch out where you go to seminary if you're going. It's sad. That's a good point, Jack. This is kind of point C to this question. It would actually be number, number 19. I'm not... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not kind of leaving the topic. I think it's so important. Uh, but the question is, what do you say to a believer? And I'm going to add here to the question. I'm going to say, add to the question and say, what do you say to the believer, pastor, um, teacher at a church who simply isn't excited about this? Now, either, maybe they haven't been taught. Um, for some reason, this topic is just not in their paradigm. So they have, they have no interest, they're not excited. When we're living in the times of the signs, we're living at the time when Jesus literally can return perhaps today. So a number of people here, obviously probably all, are waiting expectantly and yet the people in their lives and the people in the lives of those texting in these questions are dealing with pastors, friends, family members who are just bored over this, these issues. What do you say to them? Amir, what do you no, say? I, no, I, I want to say that the Bible says, not yes, me, yes. that to those who love his appearance, he will appear the second time. Hebrews 9, exactly. 28. And for, in other words, he came for the first time to save the world, not to judge, but to those who are expecting and looking forward to his appearance, he will appear the second time, the Bible says. In other words, you, the believer has to have that expectation for the return of Jesus to take him out of here. And if he doesn't have it, he needs to ask himself, how come the scriptures, not me, the scripture says that we should have it if we want to see him again coming to take us. Not, it's not my words. And therefore I'm saying something is terribly wrong with your understanding of the scriptures. Or you never probably studied that. To understand how important it is to want, to eagerly want to see him. To eagerly expect his appearance. And you know there's so many verses about Eagerly waiting, eagerly expecting, eagerly um, wanting to see him uh, again. And so there, there's a big problem in your Christian understanding, in your Bible understanding, if you don't have that thing. You know, I was picked up in an airport one day in Singapore by a, a deacon of a, a big church there and picked me up in a beautiful car and he says, oh, the Lord has blessed me so much. You know, my business is blessed beyond measure. I, I make mo more money now than I ever made in my entire life. We just started building our house. In, in Singapore, to have your own house is very rare. I mean, there, it's a very small place. He says, I'm building such a beautiful house. In fact, I don't mind that if Jesus will not come back soon, he said. Because he wants to enjoy the house. And I realized, I realized, somebody loves something else more than loving his appearance. Yeah, there's only, there's only one time when I have mercy for that kind of thinking. Maybe Barry, you too, is uh, when I marry young couples. Hmm. Right, right before we go out to do, this, to do the wedding, I, I tell the, the groom, I tell all the guys, make sure your zipper's up. <laughs> it's a big problem in a wedding. You forget. Make sure your zipper's up, and let's pray. And I pray that the Lord would come back and... The groom was like, one night, maybe one day? Can he wait? One, one day, one day, please. That's, I'll be merciful to that one. But he's, he's so correct. Listen to this. This is so precious. So precious because you couple Hebrews 9.28 mm -hmm. and listen to this. This is Paul's answer to us. Um, and I had it right in front of me. It's right here. It's 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. 
I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And finally, there's laid up for me, listen, here it comes, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. It's pretty crystal clear. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Okay, I'm going to move on just in the interest of time. And I, and I think we've heard today about, we've heard about a power shift in, in the world. It's, it's uh, gone from America. It's going to other World Economic Forum, China. I mean, these are the new power players. Uh, but all of these knees are going to bow to the Antichrist eventually. Obviously, ultimately to Jesus Christ, but before Jesus Christ, the Antichrist is going to come along and sweep the, the well, just overwhelm the world. And 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 uh, so, how does this happen? How does is China going to be a major player, or is she not going to be a major player? Is there is there time for anybody to be a major player now? Economic Forum, China, other than the Antichrist, or is the Antichrist waiting in a you know waiting in a closet back here somewhere? Not and, here. And, and, and <laughs> yes, it's, it's gonna. And, and we're we're that, we're we're, we're going we're we're going this way. We're going this way. Yeah. But he'll come out and 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 establish his kingdom. Go ahead. I think the world is going to see such chaos. Okay. that the Antichrist will be welcomed by them to bring mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the peace that they're longing for. So China will step aside. I, well, America is, has been held as the policeman of yes. the world. Do you move the police, what happens? There you go. China's now, you have to understand, every rat comes out of its hole right now. You know, North Korea resumed its nuclear program right now. China is saying anyone that is approaching the waters that are being disputed right now is actually entering into our territory. And nobody is saying a thing. Iran is attacking everywhere all yes. day long. Nobody cares. Russia understands what's going on. Turkey understands what's going on. Right now, the mice are coming out of their holes, and it's going to be such chaos that when the invasion towards Israel is going to come, and it will come, the only power that can ever help Israel in order to withstand it and survive will be the God of Israel. And there is no country, not Europe, not America, no one is going to come to help us. If that, it, it reminds me of what uh, Jesus talked to, to, to the Jewish people. If, if those days were not be shortened. Yes, yes. In other words, so my point is, I don't think China is going to control the world. I think that actually China will have a hard time even with the Antichrist. <laughs> because I don't think you can have an Antichrist no. with a powerful China. Exactly. It's just not going to work. But yeah. They're going to somehow, something's going to go wrong in China. Mm -hmm. You know what could go wrong in China, and I'm hoping for this, I'm sure you are too, <laughs> is the gospel. Mm. That's what's going to go yeah. wrong in China, is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Barry, why aren't you saying anything? I was wondering who that creepy guy in the green room was. <laughs> we need to call security to see, check the closets. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I think, Dan, that was awesome. I know. I think we have to remember that the whole geopolitical landscape is going to change during yes. the tribulation. Daniel talks about the Antichrist right. dividing the land. Revelation 17 says those who are in coalition with the Antichrist have received no kingdom as of yet. So everything's going to change uh, during the tribulation. I, I think we also have to remember, you know, China is home to the underground church, which is massive. massive. And when the rapture happens, they're going to lose a lot of people. And they're going to be just as confused as the rest of the world, which is the opportunity for this guy to come in, this smooth-talking flatterer, and deceive the whole world into following him. So come everything's going to change in a yeah. moment in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah, and Amir is so right because the scripture says that he's going to deceive the world. The first half of the tribulation period, Peace. don't be fooled. 
Yes, don't be fooled. Oh, no, the first part's fine. It's the second part that's bad. No, the seven are all bad. The front end is, Deception. Daniel says, he deceives the world by peace. Yeah. So that means you want peace. The world's going to need peace mm -hmm. and prosperity. Yes. So something economically has got to collapse. U.S. dollar soon mm. with, with what's happening. And there's going to be a need for a, a new economy. Mm. He's going to have the answer. And he's going to bring in peace because there's yeah. going to be mayhem. Mm. But even in those three and a half years of supposedly peace, make no mistake, so depravity, good. depravity will be in such level that the two witnesses, the two witnesses, whatever they say is going to be held as blasphemy and when they will finally be executed, what are they going to do to them? Publicly drag their bodies in the street and people will give to a, Right now, right now, whenever, I don't know if you've seen the footage after 9-11, 20 years ago, you and I saw it. In the streets of East Jerusalem, in the Arab Muslim section, right. they gave candies to one another. Right. When, while the Jewish side of Jerusalem was lining up to donate blood, the Arab section of Jerusalem was celebrating for what happened. Now, watch this. Now we're moving to the future. That was 20 years ago. Let's move to the future. Those two witnesses are going to be dragged in the streets of Jerusalem. And that's the peaceful time. That's not yet the war. And yet, what is going to happen? People will give gifts and candies and, and celebrate the death of the people that God sent to oh, preach. The gospel. So you, you can imagine, it's not going to be peaceful in the way you and I mm -hmm. see peaceful things. The moral standard is going to change so dramatically that what for them is going to be peaceful, for us it's going to be horrific. Now we are holding ISIS as criminals because why? They behead people. Remember, they started cutting off. In the future, that will be the practice of the government of the world. He who will not take that mark of the beast, when the beast will be here and ruling the world, his head will be chopped off. It's not going to be a crime. It's going to be the practice of the government. So we, those three and a half first years, don't be delusioned that it's going to be something that in our language will be amazing and good. No, no, no. This world is going to be in horrific reality that will put now, everything that we experience now, it, it's law and order compares to what they're going to define as peace. Can we make clear that if you're a born-again believer, you won't see that? No, Amen. You won't. The scriptures say... They will literally send gifts to one another around the world. They'll, the world will celebrate yes. sending gifts to each other. Amazing. A Amazon. It, it, yeah. <laughs> busy. Gifts. Mm -hmm. Giving. Because these two Jews are dead. Yep. These two prophets are out of the way. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. And that would be, and, and we, we pointed to some things that are going on. In Australia, sorry, don't mean to be picking. We got viewers from Australia, but, but my goodness, some of the tyranny going on there is staggering. Jack, you showed a wonderful short video today of, you know, a fool who's uh, telling people, well, I couldn't understand everything he was saying, but it goes along with what I referenced, and that is, uh, folks, in Australia, you got to wear a mask even when you're drinking in Australia. This is... Looney Tunes, I know, but this is the thinking there. Okay, so if this kind of tyranny comes to the doorstep of people in America, I believe it's very close in Canada, it's in parts of Western Europe, France for sure, how, and let, let's talk about believers. How does the believer cope with blatant tyranny? Now, the root of this tyranny here in fall of 2021 seems to be one issue, and that's vaccines. We're not here to tell you to take the vaccine or not to take the vaccine. The point is they're using that as a tool to come against good people, Christians and solid conservatives, whatever. How do we deal with this kind of tyranny? Should it, 
end up on our doorstep, Barry Stagner? What? I can't repeat that. I'm sorry. That was it's, a long good question. I so. knew she was going <laughs> to give that one to me. Yeah. We actually relinquish our <laughs> right to answer <laughs> and take the poop. Thanks. <laughs> no, you know, I, I, this whole thing has been so troubling, I know, for all of us. We have to, first of all, remember the government, government's responsibility is to protect our rights, not our health. Our health is trusted into the hands of God. And yes, we've had wonderful advances in medicine that we all have taken advantage of. And, uh, you know, we're in one of those situations where people are making a personal health decision. But when it comes down to violating your personal rights to make your own personal decisions, I think that's where we need to start standing up. And, you know, you have to remember the apostles were told not to preach in this man's name anymore. And now you've gone out and spread his name throughout the whole city. And that's when it came down to Peter and the others saying, you decide whether we ought to obey man or whether we ought to obey God. And one, when they start telling us we can't meet as a church, God said meet as a church. Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the custom of some, but even more so on the day approaching, being stirring up one another to love and good works. Now, I didn't read anything in the parentheses there that says unless there's a pandemic. So when they start telling us that we can't obey God, that's the time that we stand up against the tyranny. And you know, I, uh, Jack, you uh, put something on Telegram not too long ago, about an hour ago, about a Newsweek article about there is a group that is exempt from the vaccine mandate. Well, who is that group that's exempt? The group that's exempt from the mandate of vaccine is the entire US Congress and the White House staff's exempt. Fe uh, federal judges are exempt. Postal service? Yes, yes. Postal well, good service. for them. That's yeah. fantastic. It's okay, everyone listen. Everyone that colluded with the election. Listen. Yeah, yeah. I want you to Think about this for a moment. Yeah, it's true. A telegram, and I think I posted on Facebook as well about this Newsweek that just came out today. So, I view that as an incredible insult to my intelligence. But see, no one's going to say anything. And they'll, they'll look, and they're going to wait three days, five days, and they're going to see Americans didn't say anything about that. So they're going to, they're going to move it to the next thing. This is who we are yeah. now. Let me tell you, if Sam Adams and George Washington came back today, they wouldn't recognize, if they spoke to us personally, they wouldn't know what country we're from. Mm. No. So should we push <coughs> back against this tyranny? If it comes okay. to our doorstep, should we push back against the tyranny? So, Go ahead, Barry. Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that speaks against, listen, Every tongue that speaks against you in judgment, you shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the servant of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me. You bet we push back. We stand up. We fight until the Lord takes us home. It is our right before God. You guys, Paul, Paul the Apostle, and you've probably never heard a sermon on this before. Paul the Apostle told the Corinthians... By your obedience, punish all disobedience. You don't, you're not memorizing that verse in a little memorization card, are you? And yet it's in the Bible. So, well, what does that look like? Well, you mentioned it today earlier, today in your message, about exposing wickedness. To expose wickedness and to punish disobedience means that we are walking in the light with the Lord and that we ourselves are being obedient. The scripture says that the righteous are as bold as lions. So, yes we do. In fact, let me say this, it's owed. Our local government and our county board of supervisors and the chairman of the board of supervisors, our beloved mayor and city council, 
they have defended us by, by us exercising our faith. And look, we were going to do it with or without their approval. The point is that they stood for us and they stood up against the governor because you know what? We know them, they know us, we know their children, we pray for their families, we know them by name. We have a ministry relationship with our county in our city. This church supplies the chaplaincy program to crisis. This church supplies a publicly undisclosed amount of money to help the city meet emergency situations when people lose their homes in fires or the death of a mom and a dad and a child's left alone. That's not, we don't want that to be public news because Jesus said, don't let their right hand know what the left hand's doing. But the city knows. And you know what they did? They stood up against this governor to protect us because of a relationship. That is godly leadership. That's a godly mayor, godly city council. That's a godly county board of supervisors. So I didn't answer your question, but I wanted to acknowledge them <laughs> for, their, for their good works. Would you like to answer the question, or should I move on? And I can Let's move, move on. on. All right, that's We're, fine. You guys hungry? <laughs> oh, no. Then We... Again, this is not in the questions here, but, but we've considered today, we've considered um, some specific things to, that we've looked at. I, I pointed out to some very specific end time things going on. Pastor Barry Stagner did the, did the same thing. If we could summarize, let's just say in a paragraph or two, uh, here we are in the end of the church age. Would there be one or two things we should be watching? Now, we should always be watching the Middle East. And, and Amir, that's why we appreciate what you're doing so much because you're from there and you help us understand the mess over there. And you, you make it, you put it in easy to understand language and, and it's so valuable. So let's, let's set that aside. And just because I wanna consider some other things. Should, some, a couple of other things that we should be watching as we wind down the end of the church age. What, apostasy in the church? Um, I happen to reference, I mean, we've got lawlessness coming out of, of Washington, D.C. and in our major cities. Um, Amir, what would you tell the audience to be watching? Again, we'll just set the Middle East aside right for now because we want to look at some other things. It's going to be very hard to set the Middle East aside. I understand, but I... No, but I, I, because I, I just spoke about the fact that <laughs> yeah. Bible prophecy says nothing I, about yes. nations as between themselves or about themselves only. There's the general concept of righteousness that every nation should practice. But in reality, when you talk about Bible prophecy, Israel, of course, the fig tree coming back to life right. is the major thing. But I do see the platform all around the world for the one world government, one Thank world you. religion, and one so world important. economy. So important. So these, there's a global platforms yes. that are, be, um, are being prepared right now. And there is the regional and there is every person. Now, as a person, we, what, what did Paul write to the Thessalonians concerning the times and the seasons, my bro uh, brothers, you have no need no. that I should write to you. Why? Because Every true believer can sense inside of him the urgency of the time. So there is if people, I get tons of emails about visions and dreams. And, and young people and older people that they, they can clearly see the soon return of Jesus to take us. So there is the individual aspect. There is the national aspect. There is the global aspect. Add to that the Middle East and you get a picture yes. that... No other generation since the time of Jesus Christ had the privilege to witness. We, by far, are the most blessed generation since the time of Jesus. We've seen more prophecies being fulfilled in our lifetime than any other. How boring it is to live in the 1600s. Yes. To live in the, the, the 1300s. Think about it. They see nothing. All men were wearing wigs and stocking and all of that. Listening to... I mean, it's like... Uh, 
it, it's like we are literally watching things that I think even the prophets wish they could see. Yes, amen. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so Go ahead, Jack. I'll say this. All at once, all at once, you've got now, as Michelle said, the U.S. Failing, falling from the place of superpower, the uh, economy, the dollar's going to go away soon, uh, the w uh, threat of wars and rumors of wars, Israel back in the land, Israel now abandoned. Yes. Um, you've, Ezekiel 38. You've got, yes, the Ex Ezekiel 38 stage being clearly set. You've got the complete breakdown in family, genderism, uh, uh, LBGTQ, all of this prophesied in the Bible, Romans chapter 1. You've got all these things happening at the same time. And Daniel even warned us in the last days, right before the end, uh, we, we miss it. it. It says, Daniel says, the vision is given to Daniel. The announcement is, men shall travel to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And the word means that there will be information exchange, what we would say, light speed, and that uh, man's acquisition of information would be exploding. Um, this is what's happening. You yes. have all these things taking place at the exact same time. Never before. Never. The, the word yeah. convergence, perfect. It's exactly it. That's happening. All, all the lines are coming, like the detectives that with the, all, the, all the clues, and they start drawing the lines. Mm. And now it's so amazing. And again, like I said in, uh, in the exhortation today, the devotion was... Mm -hmm. Uh, you can't think of a better time to evangelize people. Your neighbors are scared to death. They, yeah. they just don't act like it. Yeah. They're terrified. Yeah. Good point. And now yeah. you need to lay your pride aside because let's, let's be honest, the reason why we don't tell our neighbors is because of pride. We need to lay it aside and say, hey, listen, call me crazy, whatever, but I went to a conference, went through the Bible, and long story short, you need to know that Jesus Christ was written in the Bible of, died on the cross, for our sins, rose again, <laughs> rose again from, rose again from the grave, rose again from the grave for your sins, and, and you give them the gospel. You give them the gospel. When's, when, uh, I'll wait till next week. I'll wait for, a, can, listen, I want to leave, I want to leave this with you. D can you share the gospel? Don't say anything. Can I'm just asking you, can you accurately tell someone the gospel? Do you know? Because if you're saying to your neighbor, if you go to your neighbor and you say, hi, hey, um, do you believe in God? Of course I do. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> because I thought I was going to have to tell you about Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> your neighbor, God who? What God? In America today, you have to ask what God. Because everybody believes, everybody believes in a God or gods. Mm. But did yours come in flesh and die for you to take away your guilt, shame, and to break the grave so that when you lived your last breath on earth that you see him in grace and mercy? I'm telling you, this is the time. That's why we're seeing a global response yeah. to the, well, our four ministries. I can't even imagine. Maybe somebody needs to do this. The four, just the four, these four horsemen. Of the, <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. <laughs> and Corona crown. <laughs> the, the amount of traffic our sites yeah. get yeah. in a month combined and then just recently with television, Fox, CBS, Newsmax, for what's happened to us, it's nuts. Why is this happening? Because Jesus is coming back. Yes. There's no other yes. explanation. Well, in, in, in the interest of time, let's just take the, next, the, the last couple minutes here. Each one of you gentlemen, let's encourage the flock here with however you want to encourage them. Obviously, the greatest news uh, the greatest encouragement to everyone is the fact that um, we are the privileged generation that's 
very likely going to see the king coming. You're going to see Jesus in the clouds any day. That's tremendously encouraging news, particularly in light of. Here we've talked about, in, the, in this little session here, we've talked about delusion. We've talked about the incompetence in Washington, D.C. I've used the word treason here a couple of times. We've talked about some, some tyranny. We don't want to leave on that note. We want to be able to encourage folks. Uh, Pastor Barry Stagner, how would you encourage, and we are running short on time, how would you encourage folks as we wind this event down today? Well, I don't think there's anything more comforting or encouraging than to know that this life is not all there is. Mm -hmm. And that where we're going is a place that cannot be described in human verbiage. It can't even be imagined. It's a place of untold beauty and scope and all the things that uh, we ponder and are going to experience. And, you know, Jack mentioned that old adage uh, in his message about uh, being so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. And listen, if you're heavenly minded, you're going to do more earthly good because you're going to want to take people with you because that's the only thing we can take to heaven. We have a mandate from God. I believe the Great Commission is established in the Old Testament in Proverbs 24, 11, and 12. Rescue those who are drawn towards death. Hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. And then we're admonished. If we say we did not know this, will not he who keeps the soul weigh our hearts and render to each of us according to our deeds? We are here to save souls. Yes. We are here for that purpose. And listen, that's exciting. Mm. That is a wonderful and amazing thing to do because he who wins souls yes. is wise. Mm. And that's why we're here to act on behalf of the Lord. And listen, I, I, like you, I don't find anything more exciting in life. I've been a football nut my whole life. I love, sometimes I'm just a nut, no football. But I've been a football fan my whole life. I couldn't care less about football anymore. They've messed everything up. But I'll tell you what I do get excited about. I get excited about seeing a raised hand, someone walk down the aisle, or on a field and have their eternal destiny changed. And as long as we stay focused on that, we're going to be able to handle whatever comes our way. Believe me, tell somebody about Jesus today, tomorrow, the day after that, you're going to have an exciting life. Thank you. Jesus said that he's going and leaving, and then we will do greater things than he did. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how come? Well, you know what? Jesus did heal the blind person, but the blind person died. <laughs> he resurrected Lazarus. Lazarus died again. The point is, we were given a box full of gospels. Mm. Would you, wait, what would you say? The gospel. And all he's expecting us to do is to give the gospel so, because that will give people eternal life. What is the greater, greater thing that we can do than Jesus? Is, it's not that obviously we are greater than him. It's just the fact that he left with us the most powerful pill on planet earth, which is to give people eternal life by sharing the good news. And so my point is this, he wants to find us when he comes back doing his business. He wants to find us when he comes back Sharing that, I want all of us, I want to encourage all of us, before we share anything, ask yourself 10 times, am I going to share the gospel? Is that something for eternal life? Or am I going to share desperation and hopelessness and no comfort, but, but all that? So that's all I'm saying. We've got today, we heard about information going, uh, you know, b both ways, and then it's, it's amazing. Use it. Share. 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 Click the share button as much as you can for the good news, for the hope that we have in Jesus. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, this is amazing to see in 2021, that many people sitting in one room and so many more thousands of people in more than 50 different countries watching it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And when they click the share button, hundreds of thousands more are watching it as well. So use it 
I encourage you, you have the power to do that. Share the gospel rather than any other thing and talk about that more than any other thing. Jack, give us a paragraph, please, or two paragraphs. That's, that's all excellent. I, Thank you. I would say, you're welcome. I would say that, look through the, read the Gospels again, just fr a fresh read of the Gospels and ask yourself as you read this simple question, what, what, what was Jesus most happy about when you read the Gospels? What made him happy? And I think immediately, I think it's all summed up and I, I just see Jesus actually laughing with joy when salvation came to Zacchaeus' house. Yes. And then it's a comical moment. It's precious. And Jesus is rejoicing that this, look, you guys, he's saying, look to the, to the Jewish disciples that were around him. Mm. Salvation has come. He too. It's like, it's very cute. He too is the son of Abraham. It's remarkable. So look what brings a smile to the heart of Jesus. And do the same. And I'll leave you with this. Um, recently, I've had the opportunity, recently someone uh, bowed their knees to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And what led to that was not the preaching of the gospel. They knew it. A lot of people you and I know already know the gospel. But what set this person up to bow the knee was not the knowledge of the gospel. It was the authenticity or the power of the gospel. There's a big difference. Because Jesus warned us in Matthew 7 to those who said, Jesus, we did miracles in your name. We cast out demons and we did all this in your name. And Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you. And so what happened in this person's life was that there was an authenticity. Why? What happened? And here it is. Start treating the people that you come in contact with as a believer. Don't say they're a believer. That would be wrong. Treat them as though they were a brother and sister. If they're unbelievers, say to them, oh, did you just, you know, whatever's going on in life, did you just see that? Oh, hang on a second. Oh, Lord, we just pray for that family in that accident right now that just, Lord God, please be there in Jesus' name. And they're, they're, they're going to start finding out, wait a minute, this guy's living this life. It's like, it's real to him. What is this? And this individual walked up and said, how did this happen? How did this happen to you? And I said so. Start treating people as though they were a believer and watch them warm up to authentic, real Christianity. You don't need to preach to them anymore. Isn't Augustine? Didn't he say, tell everybody about Jesus Christ and if you have to, use words. Mm. <laughs> If I could have the last word here, uh, please, and that is I've done a lot of conferences and I want you to know how much work goes into them. And Jack and his team have been working for weeks, if not months, on this event. Let's thank him. They did it. They did it all, honestly. There's, a, there's an army of people you can't see them. They're behind that black wall up there. And uh, they, they have worked so hard. They have. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank we you. love you. And we, love we you, will Jim. do it again. If the Lord tarries, we will do it again. Yes. He's not going to tarry. <laughs> um. <laughs> Will Amir close this out? By the way, the products and all of their fantastic writings will be in the gym. And we'll this. go there to meet and greet you. Yes. Uh, Amir, can you? The ironic blessing. Yeah, can you? Yes, please. And uh, let's do something a little bit different. Um, 
Amir is going to hold his hands up to pray because that's how it's done. Can we lift our hands up and just have this be a blessing that encompasses everyone in this house? Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai pana velecha v'yichuneka. Yisa Adonai pana velecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, who is the Lord of Peace, who is alone can give you that peace that surpasses all understanding. His name is Yeshua. He is our salvation. In his name we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.